Well, hello and welcome to the January 22nd, 2023 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana, specifically Hammond, Indiana. And our contact information is at the end of this video. We would love for those who are visiting the ministry through this video to come and be a part of one of our services if you are in the area. I'm excited for all that's happening at Christian Fellowship Church. Looking forward to a very blessed 2023. And I guess I should again say Happy New Year. We are excited for what Christian Fellowship Church is doing in the community. Looking forward to even next week with the testimonies that we're going to be having because we're having baptism. And we have several candidates for baptism. And if you're in the area, perhaps you would come and join us and be a part of our ministry. Use the contact information to email the church as well if you have any questions regarding what Christian Fellowship Church is all about. We'll, we like to call ourselves Hammond's Bible Church, and you'll see that in this study. We'll be in the Gospel of Luke, primarily studying chapter 16, but you'll want to open to chapter 15 because we're going to do some background material first. So get ready, have your Bibles. First we'll transition into our music ministry and then we'll come back and study God's Word.
Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 15. Luke being one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So in most Bibles, traditionally, Luke is listed as the third Gospel. And so open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. And in this study, we are going to look at one of the most significant parables, I believe, that Jesus ever told. And it's in Luke 16, but Luke 15 is the background to set the context. So that is why I'm having you open up to Luke chapter 15, verse 1. The theme of our study is how you can make an incredible impact on the world, or should I say, in this world. And I would say you're doing this for God. You're going to impact angels. You're going to impact the lost. You're going to impact the church. It's going to be a great blessing even to yourself when you participate in making the impact that Luke chapter 16 is going to be describing. Now, this sermon that I'm giving here is part of a series that we're using to start 2023 tied to our 2022 CFC, Christian Fellowship Church, planning sessions. And I'm looking forward to all that we're going to see done in 2023 and beyond at Christian Fellowship Church and last week I told you that we have a new vision statement, we have a new mission statement, and I'm excited as we work out the details of fleshing that out and, and having the goals that came out of this planning session to be implemented in our church. Now our new vision statement, remember a vision statement is the larger, bigger picture, is to know Jesus and make him known in our communities and among the nations. And that's what we want to do. We want to, make, we want to make Jesus known. And we want to know him of ourselves. And then we said the mission statement, how this is going to be fleshed out, is to glorify God by making disciples through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we want to focus on making disciples and want to become clear on our intentional efforts to make disciples. And as we had these planning meetings, we thought, Okay, what are some areas in which we can improve? And we came up with six, and we talked about achieving better visitor outreach. Second, increasing involvement by those who attend CFC. Third, by stressing education of expository teaching, the methodology, and the accompanying the company theology. We talked about prioritizing and increasing evangelism through teaching and events. Fifth, prioritizing and increasing the use of spiritual gifts through teaching and service involvement. And six, the prioritizing of the creation teaching through teaching opportunities in events. And last week, I focused on two of those because I talked about involvement and I talked about spiritual gifts. And hopefully you know your own spiritual gift then. I would greatly encourage you, if you don't, look at the video from last week, listen to our podcast as well, and see that there are some really good indicators from scripture on how to identify your spiritual gifts from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, as we are trying to increase our discipleship and make it very well, make it very intentional, I always point out that, you know, some churches you go to it to a, and they'll assign you someone who's discipling you. And that is not, we believe, biblical. Um, for example, I'm not Jesus. I can't take 12 men and make them into my image. God has given us the spiritual body to work to all disciple uh, one another and work that out. But there is the reality that if I function as a teacher and you're listening to me, I'm discipling you. If you come to our Tuesday Bible study, um, Dr. Hale, who is teaching that, is discipling you. You come to a um, opportunity to be part of our music team and our music leader is discipling you. So discipleship is uh, intentional in these different ministries that we have and we play out and we are seeing that people are beginning to understand and grasp how discipleship really functions in the local body and one of the things that we really want to do in 2023 is be intentional with this and understand that as we come today to talk about evangelism, we are being very intentional in trying to get you to understand your role, your responsibility. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, you know the truth of the gospel, the most important truth and reality I believe that any human can encounter 
because it's not just my opinion. When the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's of first importance. He's laying it out. And one million years from today, everyone who's listening to me is going to be alive. You're either going to be in a place called heaven or you're going to be in a place called hell. And it's all what you've done with Jesus. How have you turned to him and bowed to him? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Or have you rejected him? And the gospel of Jesus Christ is a very clearly um, clear message that we're sinners and that we're in trouble. Our, their sin has caused us to be separated from God for all eternity unless it's paid for. The only answer is Jesus Christ. He's God and man who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. His death paid the penalty. His resurrection shows it was complete. His exhortation to us to now, now is to believe upon him. And as he even tells us in the Gospel of John, blessed are those who believe and yet do not see. And I would encourage you, search out the scriptures. Read the Gospels of uh, John or Matthew, Mark or Luke to learn more about who Jesus is. His claims to be God beyond a shadow of a doubt. His, his <laughs> exhortations to repent and to turn. Okay, Turn from your false belief and turn from... The, uh, a system where you have yourself on the throne. And so as we come and we realize that we would have been separated from God for all eternity and we have this incredible salvation, we want other people to enjoy it as well. And that's what evangelism is. Evangelism defined is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with an aim to conversion. We just don't want to tell people about Jesus. We want to see them converted and make no bones about it. And so as we come to this as we come to this passage in Luke chapter 15 and 16, we're seeing that as Jesus is getting closer to the end of his physical life on um, I say his time on earth, he is I believe stressing the importance of understanding that this is God's heart that God wants to see people saved. And and I think the passages in Luke 15 and 16 are ones that Christians should be regularly reading. Now, let me just pick up the context. In Luke 15, we know that Jesus is about maybe about six months prior to his crucifixion. How do we know that? Well, we know from Luke chapter 9 that it talks about how Jesus has now set his direction to go to Jerusalem. And from chapter 9 to 19, out of the four Gospels, you get this long section of Scripture that deals with maybe six to the last nine months of Jesus' life. And so when we come to chapter 15, we're in the middle of this, this long section, as he's getting ready to go into Jerusalem. So chapters 9 to 19 in the Gospel of Luke play this out. So when you come to chapter 15, we have a very interesting interaction with the Jewish leadership, uh, remember the Pharisees were the more conservative, staunch people who were more into the word of God, but then they twisted it. They didn't want to always live according to the heart of it. And then you had the Sadducees who were the other Jewish leaders who were more liberal and really wanted to just be religious but not have anything to do with God's word. That's how I, 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 I've taken it. Um, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And we always remember they were sad, you see, because they didn't have a hope in the res resurrection. As we come to Luke 15, verse 1, it says, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. They we're speaking of the, the context of people that were often outcast in society. Tax collectors would be traitors, but people who betrayed the Jewish people, sinners who would be people who were maybe the drunks, people who were the prostitutes, the sexually immoral, and they're coming to listen to Jesus. But verse 2 says, both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They couldn't understand why Jesus would associate with these people, because these are the dregs of society. And yet, Jesus understands that these guys are totally missing it. And he tells them, it says in verse 3, this parable. And remember, a parable, according to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, is a, is a spiritual truth that the unbeliever isn't going to always get. It's going to be somewhat hidden. And for us who are spiritually wise and have the Spirit of God from us, and I say that humbly that we're spiritually wise, this is a, par a, a, a series of parables 
that really get us to understand God's heart. And Jesus then tells three parables, the parable of lost sheep, the parable of lost coin, parable of the prodigal son. All of those deal with something that's lost, something that gets found, and it all pictures people coming into a right relationship with God and being saved. How do I know that? Look at verse 7. When the lost sheep is found, it says, um, I, I, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So God's heart is great joy, and I think even beyond God's heart, the angels, over people who come to faith. And then you jump down to verse 9, and it says, regarding the woman and her lost coin, when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice to me, for I have found the coin which I have lost. Verse 10, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So, so you got to understand, this is God's heart. And then when you have the famous story of the prodigal son, you jump down to verse 21 when he returns, and it says, And the son said to him, Father, uh, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then verse 22, But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring in his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life and was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. So there's this sense of incredible joy and, 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 and we get the idea that within the parable of the prodigal son, the, the father of the prodigal son is God the father. So we recognize that God sees the importance of having people converted and getting involved with the world and interacting with them. Not necessarily like you go and deal with the sinners of the world and then start doing the same things. You're going to interact with them. You're going to talk with them. You're going to be interjecting into their life and letting them know that you care about them. That's what Jesus was conveying. And, and for the Pharisees and these uptight religious people, they just don't get it. How in the world could Jesus eat with them? And so now, as we lay this foundation, and that's just the context, Jesus wants to make his disciples know what they can do and how they can impact the lost. Remember, he's only got six months left. And so as we come to chapter 16... It says, now he was also saying to his disciples. Now, we don't know exactly how quickly, how soon thereafter he says this. We're going to see that we believe the Pharisee, that some Pharisees are going to still be listening as we move through the chapter. But for now, he is, he is conveying this truth that he's going to give in the parable of what's called the parable of the unrighteous steward. And he's going to tell a story, and I love stories because we can remember the stories sometimes better than we can even remember, you know, straight doctrinal truth. And here's a story that I find very, very fascinating because it is probably one of the more challenging stories that Jesus ever told because some people think, is he advocating sin? And obviously he's not. You've got to remember the parable is going to be emphasizing a spiritual truth. And not every aspect in it is going to be something that doctrinally you need to practice. And you'll catch that when we come to the big surprise part of this parable. So let's just pick up this parable. And, and the, the structure of our study is I'm going to explain the parable and then come to three principles that flow in and out of this story. So verse 1 says, Now he was also saying to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager... And the manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. Now, here we get the background of this story. We have this man who's rich. And we're going to understand he's very wealthy. This isn't somebody who is just doing well. He's extremely wealthy. And the reason we know that is, number one, he, he's a manager. and He's able to distance himself from his properties. And so, second, beyond distancing himself from the properties, he is able to... Um, incur great amounts of debt because we're going to talk about the man uh, about this rich man being owed a hundred measures of oil and a hundred measures of wheat and 
these are pretty significant amounts. Um, the, the oil is equivalent to maybe three years wages. So it could be maybe, let's say if the average salary today is $60,000, uh, it could be worth like two hundred thousand dollars, and then the other one could be like sixty to a hundred thousand um, dollars, and so to to incur that kind of debt and still be able to operate, you've got to be extremely wealthy. So we're talking about a very very wealthy individual here, and as he has perhaps been away and not um, um, dealing with at least the hand to hand operations, we see that it's reported to him. And that this man was squandering, he's been wasting, he's been embezzling, a kind of the sense there, and the idea of reported is that he has been um, slandered. Somebody is like slandering him. And so verse two says, and he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Um, this manager, this steward, one who's responsible for the assets of another. And so he goes, give an accounting to your management for you no longer can be a manager. So for whatever relationship this man has, I mean, he doesn't fire him right on the spot. And if he did fire him right on the spot, we wouldn't make for the story. So you just have to press the story so far because, you know, you, if I heard that somebody was embezzling money, I'm, I'm, you know, doing what is the modern way to fire somebody. You all have seen that where you call up security, they come to the guy's office and, you know, they say, gather up your belongings, put them in a box and we're, we're escorting you out. Well, that isn't happening here. This guy is being told, hey, you're done, but he's given some more time in the office. And so he says, give an accounting of your management. You can no longer be your manager. So verse three says, the manager said to him, what shall I do? Since my master is making, taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, I'm ashamed to beg. So he makes an assessment of himself. I don't know if he's older. <coughs> We're just gonna take this on face value. We don't know if he's just a weakling, whatever. He can't do physical labor. He's not going to be very effective in doing physical labor. And so as we come to this, we see, all right, he's in a quandary. He recognizes he's in a quandary. And he says, I, I don't want to beg. I'm, I'm, pri I'm prideful. I'm ashamed. You know, I like how he puts that. I'm, I'm ashamed to, to, to beg. So verse 4, I know what I shall do. So when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. <laughs> Again, there's this time lag here where, you know, modern day, he would have been out, but no, you know, there, there's this process going on and he's been given time. So he says, I know what I do. I'm going to, I'm going to work with these people. And at this point, you don't know what his plan is. And so we come and he says in verse five, and he summoned one of his master's debtors and began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. Now, you know, if you don't grasp that this is like three years wages, this is like $200,000, and he's just lopped off $100,000 um, in our economy, then you don't grasp, wow, this guy has just really stuck it to his manager. But, he, you know, he's trying to make friends with the person who is the debtor. And then you come to the next one, and he says, how much do you over seven and 100 measures of wheat? And he said, take your bill and write 80. And again, my understanding is that this is the equivalent of a year's wages. So you can anywhere from 60 to 100 grand now. And you, you're cutting this and you're saying write 80. So you're lopping off um, a portion of this, maybe 20%. So, you know, if it's 100,000, you're, you're lopping off $20,000. And so you get the picture here that as we're seeing an example, we don't know how many people he did this with, but this is just the example of the people that he is cutting their debt. And at this point, you're thinking, man, if the owner finds out, boy, are you even in more trouble? Because in today's economy, this is, you know, something you can be arrested for. You put in jail for this. And so verse eight, here's the surprise. And his master praised the unrighteous manager. You catch it? He's unrighteous. He's not, he's been stealing, we believe, prior to this, and he's now stealing all the more. He's doing this for himself. All right, so why would you praise? Well, because he says, for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of the light. Now, what he is saying is, this guy understands the way the world works. This guy is understanding that 
you know, people would be in debt because they don't want him turning back, coming back to the person they owe and saying, you know, if you, you know, if you just lopped off a hundred thousand dollars off of my debt, and 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 you know, I'm gonna maybe put you up in my um, guest house for a week or a year or something like that, and you know, it's only gonna cost me five thousand dollars. I surely want to save ninety-five thousand dollars, right? You, know, you understand what I'm saying? So the idea here is the idea of the shrewdness, the wisdom of being, you know manipulative and getting it what what drives people and what drives people today is is money and 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 being taken care of and and making an impact because people in of the world love money they love stuff we live in a world you know as god tells us do not love the world nor the things of the world we have to remember on the flip side the actual opposite is that this is exactly what people do they do love the world they do love the stuff of this world and we must understand that. And we who are believers in Jesus Christ are being rebuked here. We're being told the sons of this age, all right, meaning that the unbelievers, that's an expression for unbelievers, are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. That the sons of light would be the Christians. It's an expression for people who are followers of God. And what God is basically telling us here, Jesus is telling us here is that the world gets how to operate within this world. And the challenge is, do we? Do we understand? If we want to operate within this world, well, are we trying to achieve a status up the, the economic ladder, up, up the social status ladder? No. We're trying to impact people for Jesus Christ. Remember, our vision statement is to know Jesus and make him known. That's what we want to do in our communities and among our nations. And so what you want to be able to do is grasp what he is saying and saying, look, if Jesus is telling me that the average believer doesn't get it, then I want to be someone that improves. I want to be someone that gets it. And so here's our first principle that number one is you need to use your money to influence the lost. You need to use your money to influence the lost. That's what he's getting at because when he says in verse 9, And I say to you, make friends for yourself by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. What he's saying is make friends, and people in friends in this idea are, is the idea of making fellow believers. And, and it's not like we can give people a dollar and all of a sudden think that that's going to get them saved. We know the big picture, the theology of this is that they've got to come to faith in Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ, okay? But the idea, you know, in James when Abraham is called the friend of God, a friend is an equivalent of somebody that's a believer. And he says, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness. What's the wealth of unrighteousness? It's the world that the money, the world, the money system. The, the, the things that the world loves, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. And, and, you know, we know Jesus lived within the world, and when it came time to pay taxes, he, he, you know, he took that coin from the fish and said, pay my taxes with it. Because he recognized this is the way the world works, and we're in this world. But for believers, we've got to recognize our goal isn't the accumulation of wealth. It isn't how much money we have at the end. We've got to use our money in a way to impact people to show that we're not trusting in this world, that this world isn't our end game. So make friends by means of the wealth of unrighteousness so that when it fails, when's it going to fail? When this world is over or when you die, right? Either way, you know, you don't take anything with you. We've often said the illustration, you know, you when you die and they close the casket, you, you don't have... You don't take your money with you in any way, shape, or form to heaven. You know, you, you have to recognize that when it fails, it's done. This world system is not eternal. And so when it fails, they'll receive you into eternal dwellings, homes, and, and the places that are going to be um, forever. And he's talking about, you know, being greeted by people in heaven. So the idea, you have to step back and say, well, what is he saying? He says, well, the way you impact people financially 
shows that you're not part of this world and it turns their head and God uses this and blesses us as you couple it, I believe, with the gospel so that people get saved. And so the challenge then becomes, how are you using your resources to impact people? Now, I've preached this before, and I'll preach it again. You know, this is maybe a passage that pastors use to manipulate and have people give to their ch church. That's not what we do at Christian Fellowship Church. I'm telling you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I think you need to start putting money aside and start thinking about not giving it to the church, but how am I going to reach my neighbor? And think about, you know, is there a gift I can give them? Um, can I bring them over for dinner? And one of the things I'm going to tell our congregation when I preach this on a Sunday morning is what we're finding is that our culture no longer interacts with their neighbors. People are able to open up their garage door in the morning because their car's been in the garage overnight. They open the garage door, they drive out, they go to work all day, they come home, they've had uh, hired a lawn service, they, they don't do anything outside, their garage door comes up, they move their car in, they never have to come out, they live entertained with all the cable TV shows, all the access to the internet they've got, and we just don't have the interactions that we used to have. And so the challenge then is, how are we going to reach these people? And my exhortation to our body is, Start inviting your neighbors over for dinner. It's a foreign concept. It's an old concept um, to, our, to <coughs> our culture today. But people will be blown away. You're taking your money and you're making a dinner for me. And especially with the high rate of inflation today and food costing more. Yeah, you're going to turn a lot more heads. And it's not just taking people out to, to a dinner at your house or taking them out to lunch. It's somehow, some way, using your money in a way that impacts people. And God doesn't give a prescription, and I, so I can't just say, do this, do this, but I am going to be challenged in our congregation. Will you do something over the next six months? And I'm going to be challenging them, to, you know, at a minimum, look at a luncheon or look at a dinner at your house. And we're going to be working to fund people. If you need help getting this done, I will help you. But my goal is for our people to understand, use your money to influence the loss. And pray about it and think about it. Even right now, what are you thinking? What can you do? Second, as you look at verse 10, he says, He who is faithful in very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? It's a principle of faithfulness that runs through Scripture. God wants people who are faithful. And so the principle is use your money now for a big reward later. Because God... You know, God is looking at how you use your finances. And I've often said where somebody's checkbook, and when people used to have checkbooks, um, could be reviewed, it would indicate really where your heart's at. Well, the idea is, you know, God is looking at, can I give you money that you're going to be trustworthy with so that you're not just going to spend it on yourself. You're going to spend it and using it in impacting the world. Who is faithful in very little thing is faithful also in much. Because, you know, if God gives you something and you can't be found faithful, why in the world should he give you more? That's what you've got to realize. And so here's where I'm asking you to challenge yourself. Now start saying, look, you say, I don't have that much money. Well, take the little that you have. You know, you have $5, $10, take the little that you have. Use it and see what you can do. Now, I also think, that, it, that you don't want to do this just indiscriminately, walking down the street, you know, passing off a dollar here, a dollar there, five dollars there. You want to be purposeful. It's easy to do stuff with people you don't know. But, you know, when you get in a relationship with someone and then you can build upon the way that you've impacted them with the unrighteous mammon of this world. So if you're faithful in a little, you're not going to be trusted with more. That's the essence. But if you're faithful now you will be blessed later. And we don't know how exactly all the rewards and all the responsibilities we're going to be given in heaven, but we need to understand that God is basically talking about the fact that he knows that people, that people need to understand that God is watching how they use their finances. And then the third principle comes in verse 13, and he says, um, 
no servant can serve two masters, for he either hate the hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Um, the idea, money, mammon, however it wants to be, however you want to describe it, is you cannot serve both. You can't live for both, because do not love the world or the things of the, of the world. It, it, and it's a dividing thing. It's because it, if you go back and you look at that passage in 1 John chapter 2, do not love the world or the things of the world, for the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, both of pride life is not from the Father, it's of the world. So which way are you going to go? And if I've got money in my hands and now I'm going to give it to God or I'm going to give it to somebody else, if I really don't believe in the cause, it's going to be something that is going to be creating a lot of angst in me because I don't want to give this. But if I'm recognizing the bigger picture and I'm recognizing that God sees everything I do and God recognizes that what gift I'm giving to impact somebody he's going to bless, then I realize, wow, I want to do this. I want to be this type of individual. Now, part of my str struggle as a pastor is I watch people, they'll agree with this, but then life catches up with you. And I see it often even in my own life, I humbly say. But I recognize the day and age we, we live, you know, it's very evident people live for money. Our world lives for money, so when you're doing things opposite what, of the way the world, it does turn heads. I mean, I was going through some notes. I had uh, one pastor's notes. He referenced how <coughs> there was a man in 1990 who, during a, a stretch when a lot of people were being robbed for their Rolex watch, a Rolex watch is a very expensive watch. They're $10,000, $20,000 watches. A guy was robbed, and he wouldn't give his watch up, and and he he lay got shot because he wouldn't give it up to the robber and he, he he called out the names of his three children as he died but he made sure that he still had his watch and and it was just a really sad story because instead of saying you know i'll give this up because my children and, my, and being with my family is more important it was no 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 i'm not going to give up my watch and and we live in a day and age when People will die for the stuff that they that that they have to have. One woman talked about the fact that when she goes shopping, um, it's basically um, her drug of choice. She goes, and, and this was a school teacher. She said, "Men don't understand that shopping is our drug of choice." She joked while even admitting that some months her salary goes exclusively to paying the minimum balance on her credit cards. Walking through the door of of uh, the mall is like walking through the gates of heaven. And God made trunks for women to hide their shopping bags in it. And so we must understand that when we come to, to look at money, that we can't serve it. If that's all we're living for, that's all we're striving for, and we're going to accumulate it, and then you're going to, I believe in the end, find it empty because it's going to fail. And ultimately, in the end, it's not going to be blessed. And ultimately, in the end, you're going to realize you serve the wrong thing. So you can't serve God over money. you got to make a choice. Um, you know, you, you, you have to choose who you're going to serve. Choose to serve God or uh, serve God over money. That's my exhortation to you. Choose God to serve him over money. And so... How you're going to do that, I don't know, but I am going to challenge our congregation by June that you've done something. I'm hoping that for those who have the ability to bring people into their home, that you'll do just that. So, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about evangelism, right? And that's what we're trying to accomplish, and that's what we're trying to get done. Um, we want to remember that evangelism defined as sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with an aim to conversion. We need to tell people about the gospel message, and we're going to study that next week um, as we continue to keep before our people the goal of being good evangelists. Well, we got to know our message, and so I, I wanted to deal with evangelism first and then get into the gospel even more next week. But this passage is designed to get you to act with an intent regarding evangelism, to plan better with evangelism. And so, listen, with intentional purpose, you are being discipled. You're told to put this into practice and how you do it is up to you. I don't want to be a manipulative pastor saying this is exactly how it has to be done. I gave you illustrations, but I'm hoping that some of it will be played out 
whether you are doing it in a luncheon or a gift or a dinner at your house or something, please, please, please recognize the importance of this passage because it matters where people spend eternity. And the only way to spend eternity in the blessed place of heaven and recognizing heaven comes to earth, I got that, and we're going to talk more about that in future studies, is that God will let you in if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's simple to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember the ABCs. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ that he was God, man. He died on the cross and rose again. And then C, call upon his name. Call upon his name in faith. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Make sure that you have called upon the name of the Lord and that others in your life have called upon them too. The only way they can is if you impact them with the gospel. Use this passage to remember. The Pharisees didn't get it. How dare Jesus eat with sinners? How dare Jesus fraternize with these people that are traitors? Well, because he cared for them. Because we've all started lost. None of us were close to God when we were unsaved. It is foolish for anyone to think that they were a good person, worthy to go to heaven prior to coming to faith in Jesus Christ. So please, let's all get out and reach the lost. In Jesus' name.